of ComCare, I'd like to acknowledge the lands on which we're all virtually meeting. Traditional custodians of those lands, their elders, past, present and emerging, and to anyone in our audience with Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander heritage. So, for some introductions and welcome. As I said, my name's Andrew Crane and I'm part of ComCare's education and engagement team and I'll be your host for today's webinar. This webinar is part of ComCare's Safe Work Month activities and events and connects to this year's theme, Work Health and Safety Through COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic has put many organisations in their ability to rapidly respond and manage emergent health and safety risks to the test. Today we'll be discussing safety culture, safety systems and some of the lessons that have been learnt during COVID-19 pandemic that can better prepare us for the next emerging health and safety challenge or risk that we're faced with. Safety management systems are a regulatory priority for ComCare because we know that systematic and proactive management of workplace uh, safety hazards and their associated risks is more effective than using an ad hoc approach that only addresses issues as they arise. ComCare's audit findings show that some organisations within the scheme can struggle with the development and implementation of their safety systems, which in turn impacts the organisation's safety culture. I should point out that during this webinar, when we talk about scheme and jurisdiction, we're talking about the ComCare scheme and jurisdiction. So any data, anecdotes or guidance material that's referred to relates to the ComCare scheme. I know many of you joining us today fall within the ComCare scheme, but there are also many of you joining today who are covered by other work health safety regulators in your state and territory. So please be sure to always refer to the work health and safety regulator relevant to your workplace in the first instance for the most appropriate guidance, advice and data. That said, questions and issues around safety systems and safety culture are wrestled with by people across most jurisdictions. What's more important? Which comes first? Is it the chicken or the egg? Safety systems or safety culture? Hopefully, whatever jurisdiction you're in, you'll get something out of today's session to keep the conversation live about work health and safety in your workplace. So today we're joined by Bev Smith, who's the Director of Regulatory Operations in New South Wales. She has qualifications in physiotherapy, law and work health and safety and extensive experience across the fields of workplace rehabilitation, regulatory practice and work health and safety. We also have Colin McNabb, who's the Assistant Director in ComCare's Reg National Operations Group. Colin is tertiary a tertiary qualified work health and safety professional with over 22 years experience in senior work health and safety levels and has had extensive experience in, experience in auditing work health safety management systems in many organisations across a range of industries. Bev's going to start us off with a bit of discussion about COVID-19 and safety culture, followed by Colin, who will outline some important elements of safety systems, and then we'll have some time for questions that you've put through the, quest, the registration and the webinar Q&A. So, to get us going, some discussion about safety culture. Welcome, Bev Smith. Thanks, Andrew. Today, Colin and I will be providing regulator insight on how safety culture and safety management systems performed in the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic from the perspective of the regulator. ComCare regulates work health and safety under the Commonwealth Work Health and Safety Act. Our jurisdiction covers Commonwealth departments and authorities and some large private sector organisations in the fields of transport, telecommunications, banking and construction. So any data and insight offered during this presentation are from that jurisdiction only. So why are we covering both culture and systems in this presentation? It is because they're independent on each other to be effective and sustainable. It's vital that we acknowledge and remember that safety systems are all about people. They not only need to be developed with your workers in mind at a conceptual level, but at a practical and cultural level too. Because of course, it's your people, your workers and the way they actually work, not the way we imagine them to who will need to work with and implement any safety system. So if workplace safety is not seen as a priority and other factors are perceived as more important, your safety system may not be used as intended. There is ample research evidence from high risk industries such as the nuclear sector, which shows that when new work health and safety management strategies are introduced and they fail to result in improved work health and safety performance, it is often because these strategies did not include safety culture as a key element in their design, planning and implementation. 
Conversely, there is also a body evidence from organisational psychology that if you want to change or build culture, you can do this by changing formal parts of the organisation, such as its systems and processes. If these structural changes are implemented well, over time they will support and reinforce the behaviours you wish to see, as well as challenging pre-existing values and beliefs. A good example is seatbelts. During the 1970s, Australia made it mandatory to wear seatbelts. Until then, a lot of people didn't use their seatbelts and there was resistance to the requirement to buckle up. The required change in behaviour was consistently reinforced through fines and over time the wearing of the seatbelt became habitual. We now get into the car and automatically buckle up without thinking about it. So the system has driven a behavioural change. But also over the longer term, it has driven a change in our values and beliefs. I know that if I get into a vehicle now, I don't feel safe unless I'm actually wearing the seatbelt. So my values have actually changed and aligned with the enforced practice. It will be interesting to see if the push to mask up at the moment was the same pattern as the push to buckle up. So having established that both systems and the culture are equally important, I will be speaking about safety culture and Colin will be speaking about work health and safety management systems and the lessons learned from COVID. So the term safety culture was coined in the aftermath of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in 1986 to describe how the mindsets and behaviours of people and the organisation tasked with safety in the Chernobyl plant contributed to the accident. The underlying cause was a group of organisational and management factors which they termed safety culture. There are now multiple definitions of safety culture. I like the following one from the Health and Safety Executive in the UK. The safety culture of an organisation is a product of individual and group values, attitudes, perceptions, competencies, and patterns of behaviour that determine the commitment to and the style and proficiency of an organisation's health and safety management. To put it simply, safety culture can be characterised as a way we do safety around here. While there are a lot of definitions of safety culture, it is generally agreed that safety culture has four layers, which can be described using an iceberg analogy. The first layer on the slide, behaviour and symbols, incorporates the safety related actions and behaviours of employees. This is not just about compliance with procedures, it is also about safety communication, learning from safety incidents and management commitment to safety priority safety is afforded and what resources are assigned. It is also the symbols of safety you can see in the workplace, so the posters and the messaging we see around the place. Behaviour and symbols are the observable aspects of safety culture, but they only form the tip of the safety culture iceberg, and therefore they can be misleading if they're the only source of information you have about safety culture. We now, go, we now go below the surface to the organisation's management systems. Work health and safety management systems describe how safety is meant to be and how safety is put in place. They are generally seen through standards, policies, rules and procedures. The further we go down the safety climate, uh, the, the iceberg, we get to safety client, climate, which is the shared perceptions of safety. The meaning workers give to policies and practices from the behaviours they observe getting supported and rewarded on a daily basis. So a common question is, what is the difference between climate and culture? If you describe culture as the personality, climate can be described as the mood. Like one's mood it can change more quickly whereas a personality takes time to grow. So you try and shape the culture over time by changing the climate, just as you can uh, change a personality over time by changing mood. The deepest layer of the safety, safety culture iceberg is values and beliefs. These are the very deep assumptions about what the organisation cares about and why things are done in certain ways. Depending on how aligned individual employees are around these values and beliefs determines how strong and consistent or enduring the safety culture is. 
the more aligned, the stronger the culture. So what are the benefits of an effective safety culture? A culture of safety at work can be considered as a means of prevention. Instilling this mindset to workers and management can help minimise unsafe practices and potential health and safety hazards. Also, as we have discussed, a work health and safety management system would not work as effectively without a safety culture. Safety systems are implemented by people. A culture of safety, in my view, is particularly important when managing risks associated with biological hazards such as COVID-19. This is because these risks are invisible, workers can't see them, and we are relying on lower order controls such as social distancing and PPE to prevent infection. Workers are more likely to comply with those safety procedures if there's a shared understanding of the risk and commitment to safety. And if there's a gap in the procedures or they don't cover a specific circumstance, workers will be more inclined to err on the side of safety if there's a positive safety culture. There's also a growing body of evidence across a range of different industries that safety climate can impact outcomes related to safety and productivity. Now, if we think about it, it makes sense. The perceptions people have about safety, whether they think management are committed to safety and whether they see safety as a priority will influence the way an individual worker behaves, whether they speak up about safety, whether they behave in a safe way, whether they follow the rules, wear their protective equipment, and whether they report incidents. So that in turn will lead to outcomes that are positive for that individual, as well as the whole work, workplace. Broader than safety culture, there is also a wide and deep body of research and evidence linking, linking organisational culture, um, to which safety culture is a subculture, to organisational performance and productivity. So what are the characteristics of a safety culture? What, what does it look like? There is broad consensus that the following characteristics are important. Commitment of the organisation, particularly senior management, to the achievement of high standards of safety and the demonstration of this commitment through communications, consistent decision making, reward and approval systems, allocation of resources, training, a caring management attitude. The second characteristic is an effective process of communication between all parts of the organisation. And this must be based on trust, openness and mutual respect where managers and workers are encouraged and freely share critical safety information. The third factor is communication and maintenance of a shared view of risks and standards of acceptable behaviour. So individuals at all levels of the organisation need to have the same perceptions and judgment about serious risks, as those perceptions will affect their risk behaviour and what decisions they make in regard to safety. The fourth factor is being open-minded and learning from experience. An organisation must possess the willingness and the competence to draw the right conclusions from its safety information system, and it has to have the will to implement the reform. The fifth factor is ownership and acceptance of the need for health and safety controls. In a positive culture, this typically requires a participative approach to the development of those controls, and a cooperative and non-confrontational approach to securing adherence to the agreed procedures and practices. And the last characteristic is shared expectations about performance standards. This means a clear definition and communication of the organisation's expectations concerning the standard of safety to be achieved, with each individual, both management and staff, accepting their personal role and contributing and meeting contribution in meeting those expectations. This requires a clear line to be drawn between acceptable and unacceptable behaviour. It is generally agreed that to develop a strong safety culture, that it is a bad idea to punish all errors and unsafe acts, regardless of the circumstances. For example, sacking a worker after a safety incident because they missed a step in the process. This does not get to the cause of the misstep and will actually encourage the hiding of mistakes for fear of punishment or reprisals. 
the error could have been due to many organisational factors that make the employee's actions understandable in the circumstances. For example, unreasonable time pressures, lack of training, poor supervision or conflicting priorities. A cultural focus on understanding the problem and its systemic causes rather than targeting the individual has been described as a just culture and underpins a strong safety culture where individuals are prepared to identify and raise safety issues rather than hide or avoid them. So what does the management of risks associated with COVID-19 tell us about safety culture? So since the 9th of March, Comcare has had 87 concerns lodged with us regarding the management of COVID-19 risk in workplaces within our jurisdiction. The number of concerns that have been lodged actually outnumbers the number of incident notifications regarding potential exposure from an infected worker. So while there's been you know, 87 concerns lodged, the reality was when we went out to inspect those concerns, we found that the organisations were generally managing the risk in accordance with the relevant Department of Health advice. So what led to this lack of confidence in the efficacy of the control measures? And what does that tell us about culture? Okay, so this slide sets out the general characteristics of safety culture discussed previously and links them to inspection findings related to the COVID concerns raised with Comcare to try and identify opportunities for improvement in safety culture. I'll just speak to a few of our key findings. So if you recall, a key characteristic of safety culture is a demonstrated commitment to safety. While we did not find any evidence that organisations had failed to implement COVID-19 controls at an organisational level, we did identify a number of opportunities to improve the supervision and enforcement of social distancing rules at the local site level, i.e. there was an opportunity to improve the local safety leadership. The next characteristic I wish to discuss is communication, remember founded in mutual trust. Organisations reviewed had some form of mechanism in place to keep the majority of workers informed about the management of COVID-19 risks at the workplace. This was generally in the form of intranet posts, emails, two box talks and through consultative mechanisms and the health and safety rep. However, despite these communications, there was a perception among some workers, again at the site level, that organisations had not been keeping all workers fully informed of the steps taken to manage and control COVID-19. So this indicates a trust issue in those organisations. Also, having a culture where workers feel comfortable and confident in being able to report COVID-19 related hazards or concerns is key. However, workers must perceive and believe that the concerns they raise are being taken seriously and responded to. There was a perception by some workers that the concerns that had been raised about COVID-19 had been ignored. On inspection, there was no evidence that organisations were discouraging workers from reporting COVID-19 related hazards and risks. However, some of the complainants genuinely felt they were being ignored and not taken seriously by some members of the local site management. This again points to a trust issue. Another key characteristic of a safety culture is a shared view of risks. In some of the organisations inspected, work health and safety managers and teams were not directly engaged in developing or assisting the management of the COVID-19 response. In those organisations, the work health and safety risks were generally less well managed and the consultation about risk with other organisations in which they shared duties and workers was less comprehensive. The final characteristic I want to comment on is ownership and acceptance for the need for controls. For a strong safety culture, workers need to perceive, believe and witness COVID controls being implemented equally in the workplace. And where they're not being applied or followed, management need to ensure these controls are enforced. The majority of complaints inspected include concerns about COVID-19 Roles, particularly social distancing and enhanced cleaning, not being fully implemented or complied within their workplace. Again, this points to an issue with safety leadership, particularly at the local level. 
So our inspections show there is an opportunity to improve safety culture across the jurisdiction. The next question is how, how do we do this? So the first step is to measure your culture to get an understanding of where you need to focus. And the slide there um, has uh, the general type of tools that you may use to measure each layer. So the organisational factors, observations, audits, behaviours, um, you can include questionnaires as well. And then when we get to the psychological factors for safety climate, we're looking at surveys, questionnaires and interviews. Another approach is to use safety, the safety culture maturity model. So since 2014, safety culture maturity models have increased in popularity as a means of diagnosing safety culture. Research to date has not been able to draw any firm conclusions about the reliability and validity of using maturity models, but there has been some mining studies that link lower incident rates with the high safety culture maturity. Safety culture maturity assessment, however, is really about providing a structured approach for organisations to understand how mature their systems are and how to develop a plan to keep improving their safety efforts and continue their cultural journey. The most effective way to do this is to put in place processes and practices that will move you one stage at a time. You may be familiar with the Patrick Hudson model that is on the slide right now. A more approachable version developed by a team from Monash University uses three stages. Stage one, I have to, is the beginning stage where safety is probably not a strong cultural value and driven mainly by some external need to do it, such as avoiding a fine or complying with a contractual obligation. Stage two, I want to, is more effective for safety performance because it's now priority. The focus at this stage is embedding a value for safety and formalising it through safety systems. Stage three, it's normal, is the most effective level of maturity for safety and means that safety and production are integrated. Safely, safety simply becomes a natural way of doing business. Like when you get in the car, you put on the seatbelt without thinking about it. So if we want to improve our safety culture, what are the key drivers? Research showed that there are three key drivers of safety culture, management systems, organisational structure and safety leadership. So in terms of management systems and organisational structure, the Australian Institute of Health and Safety has argued that rather than trying to change something as nebulous as safety culture, the focus should shift to changing the organisational or the management practices that have an immediate and direct impact on workplace safety. Professor Andrew Hopkins, who I'm sure we've all heard, who I'm sure you've all heard about, argues that organisational practices are the culture, what we collectively do around here. So what these views do is emphasise the importance of the safety management system in directing organisational practices that will in turn influence worker behaviour, safety climate and ultimately safety culture. In terms of safety leadership as another key driver, research shows that safety leadership enhances the safety culture and improves safety behaviour. Key groups and individuals can therefore play a big role in establishing a safety culture and sustaining it. So these should include the CEO, your senior management and leadership at all levels, your health and safety representatives, particularly important, and of course, the workers themselves. Our recent inspections of COVID-19 concerns would indicate that it is particularly important to give attention to supervisors and middle level managers at the local level, helping them to have skills and training and knowledge they need so they've got the capacity to support the desired practices and behaviours, and they're not going to be undermined by the pressure of deadlines or workloads. You should note that the hours go both ways in my model, and that's because, as we've alluded to previously, a strong safety culture will lead to improved effectiveness of your safety systems, strategies, and safety leadership. So ultimately, you end up in a uh, a continuous loop of improvement in safety outcomes. So I'll finish with some key takeaways. Firstly, 
Having a positive safety culture is particularly important in managing biological risks such as COVID-19, where risks are invisible and their management at the front line often relies on low order controls. Secondly, inspections indicate that there are opportunities to drive improvement in safety culture, particularly through improved communication, trust, safety leadership at the site level. Lastly, the importance of the safety management system in driving safety culture and vice versa. On that point, I'll hand over to Colin, who will be speaking about safety systems in much more detail. Thank you. Thanks, Bev. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, while Bev spoke about safety culture, I will take you through some of the key elements of a safety system and ways to use a systems approach in response to COVID-19. In this presentation, the WHS Act uses the term PCBU, or person conducting a business or undertaking. When I say this, I mean employer. As a minimum, all PCBUs must comply with or exceed WHS legislation. How this is achieved is up to the individual PCBU. Officers of a PCBU are also required to comply with due diligence responsibilities under the Act. A systems approach can help with those responsibilities. The systems being described today has five elements, policy, planning, implementation, measurement and review. Or it can be looked at as a policy plan, do check act process, which is a continuing continuous improvement cycle. So what constitutes an effective WHSMS? It's not simply the existence of policies, processes or forms, but the way they are developed and implemented in consultation with workers. An effective WHS management system needs to be an evolving and continuously improving process. It uses feedback to manage and improve safety related outcomes, builds upon existing WHS processes, demonstrates due diligence, provides for more informed decision making, strengthens the corporate culture and integrates with other management systems. Business continuity management. Our, our colleagues at ComCover have de developed this particular business continuity management model. You'll see along the bottom of the pyramid, it covers areas such as business recovery procedures, ICT disaster recovery plans, and of course, pandemic plans. Your organization will also have an enterprise risk management plan and this will also have a line, a line item covering WHS, WHS. The integration of the WHS management system with other business processes, such as the business continuity and enterprise risk, strengthens the continuous improvement. So let's revisit the structure of the system. We talk about policy, planning, implementation, measurement and review. These five elements are broken down into 21 sub elements. These in turn are broken down into 108 criteria of the National Audit Tool. The following slides look at some of the problems, problem areas identified by Comcare's inspectorate when managing COVID-19. Using a musical analogy, the 21 sub-elements we talked about can be thought of as individual keys that must be pressed in unison to make musical chords. In the following slides, we will look at a chord made up of legal, training, consultation, communication, hazard ID, risk assessment and control, and records management. 
First of all, let's look at the risk management process. It has four steps. The identification of hazards, the assessment of risks, the control of risks using the hierarchy of controls, and the review of those control measures. A systems approach to COVID-19 still requires a risk-based approach. What are the hazards? Where can you find reliable information about those hazards? How do you communicate the risks? How do you develop controls in accordance with the hierarchy of controls? How do you ensure that the agreed controls are in place are effective? And what are the unintended hazards created from the change in work practices, such as psychosocial or ergonomics when working in the home environment? Comcare's inspectors have identified weaknesses in the management of shared duty holders. Any COVID response will involve shared duty holders such as landlords, co-tenants, cleaners or security staff and PCBUs need to identify all shared duty holders and undertake effective communication, consultation and coordination with them. They must identify and manage the risks that other PCBUs may introduce into the workplace. Identify and manage workplace access and egress such as the elevators and rented buildings and the number of people permitted to use them. Identify and assure that contracted services are provided to the necessary standard, such as a cleaning process meeting specified guidelines. WHS consultation and communication. When developing, with regard to consultation, when developing policy and procedures for the management of COVID-19, it is important that all stakeholders are consulted. Consultation with health and safety reps and other workplace representatives must be undertaken. And communicating to workers on how the PCBU is protecting their health and the health of the community should also be undertaken. Along with social distancing and good hygiene, personal protective equipment plays an important part in protecting workers and the community. But to be effective, the PPE must be fit for purpose. In this example, Safe Work New South Wales issued a safety alert on the 5th of May 2020 on the subject of fake face masks. In Australia, disposable respirators and filters are classified and marked as P1, P2 or P3 in accordance with Australian standards. Does your PP meet the standards? And what is your purchasing policy and procedure? When purchasing, always source PP from reputable suppliers. The CSIRO has developed a mask testing lab and manufacturers that pass the test will meet both Australian and international standards and can be placed on the Australian register for therapeutic goods. By way of example, this photo photograph was taken at a chemist in central Canberra. The green banner reads, masks Australian tested and TGA registered. When purchasing PPE, when considering PPE, you must know what the legal responsibilities are. When purchasing PPE, you must specify exactly what you require. And when it's delivered, the PCBU must verify that what was received meets the PCB, PCBU's requirements. Don't fall into the trap of issuing inferior personal protective equipment. When issuing PPE, you have to take into consideration that this applies more to just face masks than COVID. This applies to other PPE that has been identified through your risk management processes. When supplying PPE, the workers must know 
why they have to wear it, when to use it, and how to click, correctly use, store, and maintain and dispose of it. Records must be kept of all training instructions given to workers on the above, and adequate supervision must be applied to ensure the policy is adhered to. Comcare has developed some materials to assist employers and workers with the use of face masks. We have developed an online tutorial known as a MicroLearn, which takes you through the WHS obligations relating to the wearing of masks and guidance on how to use them. And also printable posters are also available on how to safely wear a face covering. So learnings from the bushfires. While significant, COVID-19 is just one hazard. Many organisations experienced the devastating bushfires earlier this year. From the bushfires, there was an opportunity to learn and plan. Organisations who learnt from the experience were more prepared to handle the COVID challenges through practiced emergency procedures, covering large scale deployments of emergency, medical and military services. The extensive use of PPE, travel restrictions and the management of vulnerable workers, amongst other things. If your organisation is considering the development of a safety management system, there are a number of tools available. There is a link in the QA bar which takes you to the Comcare website. Links will also be available under the recording of this session. Be prepared for the next hazard through the implementation of systems approach. Your workers rely on you making the right decisions in a timely manner. Don't go around in circles and don't let things slip through the cracks. Thank you. Thanks, Bev. Thanks, Colin, for such interesting and informative uh, presentations. So Bev, it seems at one level, culture is quite simple, particularly when described as just the way we do things around here. A bit like air or water, it permeates everything and we can see the effects of it pretty easily. But when you really try to grasp a hold of exactly what it is, it becomes a bit more complicated and it's not quite so easy to grab a hold of directly. But as you mentioned that it's leadership messaging, leadership behaviours, organisational structures and systems that help direct the flow of like water or air, the culture to encourage the development of a desired culture that emphasises uh, health and safety. And Colin, you um, discussed safety systems, which are more tangible and they can be assessed against validated tools or standards. However, there's no one size fits all with each system needing to be shaped or fitted to the particular organisation. Um, I really like the music metaphor uh, that you use, Colin, uh, with the elements of the system like the individual notes that might be played together to make a harmonious chord. So now we've got some time to have a bit of discussion um, and answer some of the questions that our audiences uh, submitted today and through the registration um, process. And the first one I'll throw to you, Colin, which is um, people often are asking why can't Tom Comcare tell me exactly what I need to do for my safety system? Yes, we, we hear that question quite often uh, during audits. The answer is that you know your business better than we do. Um, we can certainly uh, provide frameworks uh, to, to allow you to build a system uh, based on standards. But uh, you know your organisation, you know what the risks are, you know the culture within your organisation. So it's uh, really up to you to build the system from the ground up. Okay. That makes sense. It does make sense. Uh, and uh, I'll give one to you, Bev, um, which is somebody's asked about um, influencing safety culture where they don't have managerial powers. How, how can somebody without managerial powers influence um, the safety culture of a workplace? Well, I, I'm I suppose in my presentation, what I was trying to get across is that 
safety leadership is fundamental to building a culture and safety leadership is at all levels of the organisation. So, so everybody has an opportunity to influence safety culture and safety behaviour in their local work group. Um, so if you, I think for an effective safety culture, it is, it is the importance of, of all to do that. Um, and if it's not being driven from above, I mean, that's obviously very problematic in building and sustaining a safety culture. And um, that's why the Work Health and Safety Act has due diligence obligations in it because it recognises the importance of senior leadership in driving safety systems and safety cultures. But the safety, the work health and safety legislation also has worker duties. And those worker duties also um, envisage the importance and responsibility of workers driving safety systems and safety cultures. So it's not an excuse and you can influence it at your local level. And in fact, the issues that we saw in COVID were actually at that local site level. So, um, you know, workers should be expecting um, their, their leaders at the local level to be accountable for leading good safety practices. Great, thanks, Bev. So I guess, yeah, you have um, your formal leaders, but also um, informal leaders and safety champions there as well uh, that can really make a difference. Uh, another one for you, uh, Colin, we've got um, a question around, are we compelled to implement a system and are we required to do audits around due diligence, consultation, managing risks, uh, legislative um, underpinning for work health safety management systems? I suppose the basic answer for that one is that there is no legislative requirement to, to implement a system. But as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the, the due diligence requirement for officers under 27, section 27 of the Act, um, the system will allow you to demonstrate that you're actually meeting those processes. Uh, and, th and that's the main underpinning of that. With regard to the, the audits, um, again, there is no requirement to actually go out and do audits, but you really need to know what's, the, uh, what's actually happening in, in your workplace. And the audits are the really only, um, unless it's legislative required, audits are the only way that you're going to get a, a, um, a true understanding of how your, your system is actually operating or the way you manage safety is operating. So um, again, audits will be a, a due diligence um, outcome as part of that process. Great, thanks Con. So I mean, I guess you could um, use any of those sort of validated tools um, and either do it as an internal audit or an external audit um, with a consultant or with um, your regulator. That's correct. Uh, so one for Bev, um, look, and it was really, there's a really positive column comment in there. Many thanks, Bev. Um, even with a good organisational safety culture, how do you deal with safety fatigue? As COVID, safety systems can feel repetitive um, and mute in environments where there are no current active cases. How do you keep that mindfulness around health and safety? That's where your safety leadership is critical. Um, and also, you need to make sure that you've got that shared perception of risk. So in a, in, in a good safety culture, remember we discussed that everybody has the same shared perception of risk. So you need to keep that risk, risk particularly with invisible risks, you need to keep that risk perception alive. So you, I, I can't emphasise the importance of your leaders, so your supervisors, your managers, your senior leaders actually continuing to drive the importance of um, the controls that are in place, reinforcing those, pulling people up when they're not doing them, rewarding those behaviours that, that are complying with those controls and showing that commitment that's probably going to be pivotal in dealing with any sort of safety fatigue. And that really gets down to leadership at all levels of the organisation. 
Yeah, great. Uh, so another really positive one here, um, saying thanks for the presentation um, and asking, interesting to consider the effectiveness of uh, safety management system consultation where there's a low maturity safety culture. Uh, and the question is around would creating a positive safety culture first improve the safety management system development, do you think? Maybe I'll throw that to both of you, but start with Colin, um, since you've just been on the hot seat, Bev. Okay, so safety, safety culture, yes. Uh, I think uh, part of the, the indication of a good safety culture when we uh, do the audits of federal employers is um, you can tell um, due to the uh, senior management commitment, uh, senior, senior officers are actually at the opening meetings of, uh, of audits and taking a keen interest throughout the whole process. So I think the, the three, um, three factors that uh, that build a, a good safety system and a good safety culture is the uh, senior management commitment, um, a direction to take a, a path of a system so everybody knows where they're going and when they're going to get there, and uh, and also um, professional WHS uh, managers or uh, practitioners on the ground. Those are the three things that we've identified that are success factors in, in a good uh, safety culture and a good system organizations. And Bev, did you have any thoughts? Oh, look, I would agree with Colin. I know from my own experience um, in terms of work health and safety where I've had to implement a work health and safety system right from scratch in a large organization that having the support of the key leadership was absolutely critical because right from the outset you, you need to have resources to do it to, you, you, you can't pull these things out of thin air you, you need to have that commitment there to provide that resourcing and to drive the messaging about how important this is because when you're building a, a safety system it has to be done in consultation with the business because it's got a, ultimately a mature system needs to integrate into the business and be seamless and so to, 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 to get that engagement in the building of the safety system really requires your key senior leadership. Um, but then what happens is that as you build that strong safety culture, your system gets, will, will be used more effectively. I mean, just at the basic level in terms of incident reporting. So you can have the best incident reporting system, but unless people, um, uh, have the confidence and the trust in the organisation to report those incidents, particularly um, dangerous incidents where there hasn't been any injury, which are really good early indicators of where you've got problems at, then, then they're not going to, to use your system. So I, I, I think Colin, Colin's findings, I would agree with from my own experiences of implementing safety system. It's, it's, it's really your key leadership support right at the outset is absolutely critical. Yes, thanks. And I'm sure I've heard uh, possibly yourself and others talk about um, many examples where uh, organisations can have great systems that have been developed by a really good work health safety practitioner, but if there isn't the um, the safety culture and the leadership drive to support it, it just sits on the shelf um, and uh, basically does nothing because people don't um, get in and start um, using it. Uh, I think is it, um, is it Cotter's model of change that they need to have that, um, you know, that real guiding uh, vision uh, that's being driven um, through the organisation that says this is important uh, and we're going to make a change, uh, be it a safety system or any other organisational change. Uh, so I've got another question here around, um, is it possible to measure the hidden layers, safety, climate, values and beliefs? What are some of the ways that workplaces can, can consult and communicate with workers at a time? Oh, sorry, there's two questions, I'm asking two at once. So the first question was um, for Bev around, can you measure some of those hidden layers, safety, climate, um, values and beliefs? Is, the, is there a tool or something that you could use? There's uh, there's many tools out there, um, and what you need to do is 
work through what would suit your organisation and where your culture is at the moment. Um, there's tools out there, so um, uh, the psychosocial climate tools, um, surveys, um, there's uh, early indicators, um, there's tools to help you with early indicators of, of, of what sort of culture you're developing and what the impact would be. So there's, there, there are many tools out there. I can't prescribe which ones are, are best for your organisation, but um, if you pop on to say Comcare's website, um, we've been supporting some research into two particular tools um, that would assist you measure your uh, psychosocial climate. Um, and there are other tools out there that, that have been researched and validated um, that, that, that you could use. Great, thanks, Steve. <laughs> Uh, so yes, that's uh, Comcare has been involved in a lead indicators project, um, which is involving that um, people at work um, psychosocial uh, climate tool. Um, now, Colin, we've had a few questions come in around uh, the standards uh, around 45,000, uh, 45001 um, and um, one question is around what's Comcare's position. Uh, another question was around, you know, do we have to change our um, system um, from one standard to another? Does Comcare have a sort of a position on this? In essence, uh, organisations, uh, the introduction of um, systems uh, may be driven by um, departmental policy or organisational policy based on requirements to have a certified system. So if you have a certified system that's uh, certified to 4801, uh, 40 there may be a requirement for you to then transfer across to 45001 at some stage uh, to meet those requirements. But from the federal employer's point of view, <clears throat> you are basically free to use whatever system it meets your organization's requirements. We uh, in Comcare use the national audit tool to test the systems, which is based on 4801. Um, the five elements that I talked about are the 21 uh, sub-elements. Uh, there is talk about um, looking at the national audit tool through the heads of workers' uh, compensation authorities to bring it up to uh, the 45,001 uh, requirements. So there is a working group that's been developed um, by Hauka uh, to look at the existing national audit tool uh, and align it with 45,001. So, I suppose the, the short answer is federal employers can use whichever standard will, will meet their requirements and also the business requirements as well. So if you need it to uh, to get contracts or whatever, then that's you would be driven to to use probably 45,001. Great. Thanks, Colin. Uh, so I had another question come in around uh, what's the impact of on safety culture of the unwritten ground rules that sort of exist in org organisations? Can you comment on the relationship between uh, culture and the unwritten ground rules? Are these maybe the same thing, Bev? Yes, I, 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 I think um, from what I can see from the question, I, I, I think they they are the same thing because when we talk about, that's when you're talking about values and beliefs. So that's a very ingrained part in terms of what people um, really believe, um, they what they really believe about safety and what they believe the organisation think say how they should behave around safety and they're not written um, and they're not obvious they're, they're at the deepest level of that iceberg and that is the hardest thing to change um, so that's why you focus at the practice at, you know at the um, at, your, at your, your safety practices and and why you look at your safety climate because that's how ultimately over time you can influence those behaviours. I mean, there is there is research with humans that says if you if your values um, if 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 your values are out of alignment with the way that you're forced to behave, you'll actually bring them into alignment because humans don't like to be don't like to have 
their values out of alignment, uh, dissonance with, with, with how they're forced to behave. And so ultimately you will change those values, but they are unwritten, you can't see them. Right. Uh, cognitive dissonance, um, I think is the term they use, isn't it? Um, yes. there is, um, people want to reconcile that cognitive dissonance within themselves. Uh, so maybe just uh, one more question, uh, which is around um, safety into performance appraisals for employees you know, as a policy or whatever. Is, is it possible to do that? Is that something that's an acceptable thing to do? Do you have any thoughts? Safety in a performance appraisal, as yeah. in, uh, um, yeah, the, the no, question's I, not specific, think, it's around, um, yeah, is it possible to include um, safety criteria, um, health and safety metrics in somebody's um, employment performance appraisals? Well, yes, I think that's quite common, um, particularly um, in high risk industry that that it is included um, and ultimately um, because their safety performance will impact on whether they win business or not so it's it's not a new concept it is something that uh, a lot of organizations uh, do and they have key metrics that they particularly hold their managers and leaders accountable to um, you could, I, I don't see any reason why um, why you couldn't bring that down if you wanted to drive a safety culture, why you couldn't bring that down to your workers level and include, um, include we, we include other types of behaviours in our code of conduct, why you can't have conduct or your expected behaviours about safety be included in, in those behaviours um, that that we hold people accountable to through a performance management process. Yep, great. Um, and there's, there, there is certainly that famous um, quote about what gets uh, what gets measured gets uh, managed. Uh, yes. So if that's, uh, you're accountable for it, you tend to um, put a lot of focus on it. So um, that's all of our time for questions today. And I'm not sure if we ended up answering the question about the chicken or the egg, what's more important, safety systems or safety culture? As Bev um, said, systems of culture, they're interdependent elements. And I've heard it described with a baking analogy that the safety system is like getting all the ingredients to bake a loaf of bread together, but it's the safety culture, like the sourdough starter or the yeast that brings it all together into something that works really well. What do you think? Let us know what your thoughts are in the Q&A. On behalf of Comcare and the audience watching, I'd really like to thank Bev and Colin for your presentations, but also for taking a ride on the hot seats today, answering some of our um, audience's questions, um, as well as our production team that's behind the scenes today. We also wanna say a big thank you to all of you, our audience, for taking the time to be part of this webinar, to keep the conversation alive about work health and safety this Work Health Safety Month uh, and beyond. So this is the last of our Safe Work Month webinar series. If you missed out on the other webinars earlier in the month, please check out our website and the, the link is going to be in the chat uh, right now. Finally, we'll be sending out a super quick survey to everyone who's registered and we'd really love to hear your feedback. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you. Stay safe, stay well and see you soon. <laughs>